who were criticizing him for healing a man on the Sabbath day. Can you imagine that? Criticizing him for doing good, picking it apart because it was done on a Sabbath day. So Jesus deals with that. Then the next thing they do is they accuse him of healing the man with the power of the devil. Well, that's another misnomer, crazy accusation, and we dealt with that last week about hearts and kingdoms being divided and how is their power if a kingdom is divided, and we talked a little bit about last week how Satan's kingdom is not divided. Satan is very unified on the total depravity and destruction of your life. Satan never has to have a committee meeting and saying, you know, maybe we're just being a little bit too demonic. Maybe we need to be a little demonic light, you know, or maybe we just need a little more love out there. They never have those problems in hell. They have a predetermined agenda that they're unified and they want to see you and your family completely destroyed. They want to see your faith eroded. That's their vision and their dream. So Jesus dealt with that. And now he gets to verse 30 And he makes this statement, and it's a fairly bold statement, but it's a very true one. He says, anyone who isn't with me opposes me, and anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. Jesus says, if you're not for us, you're against us. Now, that's a little black and white in a politically correct age. What about diversity? What about everybody being able to freely express what they think? Jesus cuts through all that mustard and he says, "Uh uh-uh, if you're not for me, you're against me. He leaves no middle ground. Now, one thing we see in our world today and in our culture that we're messing around with middle ground all the time. We want, we kind of live in this area of gray, this subjective truth area, you know, like, hey, well, what is your truth? Hey, I'm glad that's, that's good. I'm glad your, tr- your truth is working for you. It's absolute stupidity. There are absolutes. Like I've always said, gravity still works even if you're a Buddhist. You jump off a bridge, you jump off a hill, you're going to go down, you know? Like it's just... There are laws out there. There are absolutes. It just doesn't matter what you believe about them. They're true. And so Jesus makes the claim and he just makes the statement, you are either for me or you are against me. And that is offensive to us today. Not maybe to you, but to the culture. How can you say that it's either or? What about all of us together being happy and Finding the truth on our own individual pathway. It's such nonsense. I was on an airplane a few years ago, and I was sitting next to a doctor. And I've always thought, you know, doctors are pretty smart guys because I'm not a doctor. And I figure any guy that can go to university for, what, eight years has got to, you know, just, I just stay for eight years has got to have something going on. So I always figured doctors were smart guys. And, and uh, so... We got chatting for a few minutes, and he said, uh, what do you do for, I said to him, what do you do for a living? He said, well, I'm a doctor, because that's how I knew he was a doctor. And he said, uh, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a, I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. Oh, he says, wow. He says, I, you know, he's all of a sudden, he's, he wants to talk now all of a sudden, you know. And, and he said, you know, he said, I believe all roads lead to heaven. I says, wow, that's a very interesting statement coming from a doctor. I says, but I'm going to get off the plane before we take off. He says, what do you mean? I says, well, are you willing to put your life in the hands of this pilot if he came on the announcement system and said, all flight paths lead to New York. We're just going to pick a random one and all of them will get us there eventually. I said, we'd be off this plane so fast you wouldn't know what hit us. I said, when you get in your car, do you just randomly go down a road because all roads get you to your doctor's office? And he goes, well, I never really thought about that before. I says, well, you might want to think about that because your road determines your destination. I thought that was pretty brilliant for a non-doctor to be talking to a doctor. (laughs) I realized, you know what? The word of God makes you smarter than the stuff of the world. 
Listen, there's some truth out there that if you leave church today and you pick any road you want to pick to get home, you're not getting home. There is a route to your house, and you've got to take that route if you want to get there. You can't turn in any driveway on your street and get to your house. If you do, you might get shot. <laughs> this is America, after all. People have guns down here. You can't take... <laughs> Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. It's, a, it's just a clear, straight-up deal. And that may offend you, but it's true. Jesus says, if you're not with me, you're against me. And if you're not working with me, you're working against me. Now, that's true in any job. My dad used to say that to me when I was growing up. My dad was a carpenter, and we'd be out doing projects all the time. And when I was, especially when I was little and not totally getting it, he'd go, hey, Davey, work with me, buddy. Work with me. You know, if you're on the end of a saw, remember those old saws that you would, one guy on this end and one guy on that end, the old, uh, what were they called? Uh, a, misery <laughs> a misery blade? Is that what you called it? <laughs> yeah. So what were they called, saws? What was the, a crosscut saw. Thank you very much. Some of you older guys knew what that was. Everyone else, you know. We just use power tools now. Well, but you get on that cross cut and you had, to, you had to get into a rhythm together if you were going to be successful in cutting that wood. You couldn't work against each other or you'd never get it done. <coughs> Ever tried to lift furniture with somebody that wasn't kind of with you? Man, you're against me and it's like it's, it's going to be a problem. Ever put someone on the back of a motorcycle that doesn't know how to ride on a motorcycle? If you're not with me, you're against me, and we're going in the ditch. Don't lean that way. You lean this way. Lean with the bike. Oh, I thought it was the other way. I won't tell you who said that. You wonder why there's no backrest on my motorcycle, because it's for soloing anyway, but anyway, it's... If you're not working with me, you're working against me. Hey, question. Are you with us? When you're here in the River of Life, are you excited about this church? Are you excited about what God's doing? Do you want to be a part of this? Because we need to be working together. That's the key of what Jesus is saying here. Then he goes a little deeper on us in verse 31. says, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit which will never be forgiven. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, neither in this world or in the world to come. Now that, folks, is a heavy passage of Scripture. Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, in this particular place, says this. In your struggle, in your journey, in your sinfulness, there are times, if you blaspheme me, he said, that I can forgive. But if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, now remember, he's addressing the Pharisees who were doing what? They were calling what God was doing the work of the devil. He said, if you attribute the work of God's Spirit to the work of the devil, that is blasphemy. Do not do that. Do not do that. That's the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. We know we are convicted by the Holy Spirit. We know that the work that God does in us, the change that he brings about in us, is a work done by the Spirit. That's how that happens. And so the ultimate blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is to resist and push away the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And Jesus is saying that if you blaspheme, if you harden, if you push against the Holy Spirit's work in your life, there is no ultimate forgiveness for that because that's where you will leave yourself ending up unchanged, unregenerated, unconverted, unsaved. You will stand before God in your righteousness, not in his righteousness, and he said you will be damned. Do not harden your heart. One of the great fallacies of our time is that we can come to God at any time. There was a committee meeting in hell one time. This is a story. 
This is not in your Bible. This is an illustration. And one of the demons said to the devil, he said, you know, maybe what we should do is tell people that there's no God. That's the way we'll deceive them. Just tell them there's no God. Make the whole world atheist. And the devil said, yeah, he said, you could try that. He says, but the law of God's written in the heart of man. He said, you're, never gonna, you're not going to root that out. He said, even if you try and sell that message, he said, it's not ultimately going to work because people will still be pricked by the law of God that's written in their heart, and they're going to figure it out that God is real. Well, one of the guys says, well, why don't we tell them that there's a God, but there's no devil, and so that everything is just peace and love, and God just loves everybody, and it's just all wonderful, and you can kind of do whatever you want. It's all flowers and roses and smelly things, and, and, and God will just, you know, you just, it's all going to be peace and love, man. It's just peace and love. And the devil says, well, he says, yeah, but he says, you know, there is evil. And he says, we are evil. And, and the evil that we do, people are going to figure out that where does that evil come from? The third demon spoke up. He said, hey, I got a better idea. He said, let's tell people there's a God and he loves them. And that there's only one way to God and that's through Jesus Christ. And let's tell the world that there is a devil and he's out to destroy you and he's evil and he's wicked. And he's going to do everything he can to bring your soul down into hell. Let's tell them both those things. But tell them they got all the time in the world to figure it out. And isn't that the truth? That's kind of what we're doing in our culture today. We got all the time in the world to figure it out. We just kind of cruise through and I'll come to God on my terms. I'll come to God when I'm ready. I'll come to God when I'm older. I'll come to God when I've got a problem. I'll just do it on my own time. My friends, that's a deception. That's a deception. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And I'm always careful, and I want to encourage you to be careful about being critical toward things that we don't fully understand. Paul said, and there was a time in Paul's, now remember, Paul is one of the first guys out in the New Testament, one of the first guys to go out and preach the gospel and do evangelism and missionary work and plant churches and, and the gospel really expanded into the Gentile world under the ministry of Paul and Barnabas and Saul and, or Saul and uh, Paul and Silas. Silas. I was going to say Cyrus. I mean, it's not Cyrus. Silas, my brain's going to sleep. And, and, and so they went out and they, they planted churches and they preached and it was all over there. But even in that time, in that season, there were people going out preaching the gospel for money. They were going out preaching for the offerings and they were living these lavish lifestyles and doing things in the church and through church that wasn't right. And it was a problem. And Paul said this, he said, listen, I don't even care about that as long as the gospel is being preached. You think, well, Paul, wait a minute. Now, Paul did teach us how to discern. He told us to guard our hearts against false teaching and false doctrine. Yes, we're to do that. But I think we need to be very careful. We need to be very guarded against being critical to what we perceive is the spirit and what we perceive is not the spirit because we don't know sometimes. We don't know what the Lord is up to over there in that area, in that city, in that church, in that ministry. And you know what? Like I said last week, we don't have to have an opinion on everything. We can just shut up. And just let them do what they're doing over there. I'm, I'm concerned about Stanwood Camano in the I-5 corridor. I've got enough on my plate with you guys. I don't need to be worried about those guys. We need a revival in this church, in this town, in this city. Hey, let's not be worried about what they're doing over there and over here and over there. Let's just get down on our face before the Lord and say, Lord, do something here. So I don't want to be a church that's got a flipping tongue criticizing and having opinions about everyone else's ministry. Yeah. Amen? Yeah, thank you for the four of you that agree with that. <laughs> because it's not our concern. It's not our problem. And I don't know what God's doing or what God's speaking to those guys about. It's none of my business. We need to be worried about us. What God's doing here. So Jesus says, and that's, and that's it, so guard your heart against speaking against what, because I know in, in our church, you know, let's face it, in church world, if you look at the continuum between, you know, Catholicism and old line, main line churches, 
And what is, you know, probably biblically balanced churches way on out to the extreme of hyper charismania. Anywhere in between there, you're going to find stuff to look at and go, I don't agree with that, I don't agree with that, I don't agree with that. I don't agree. You, could, you could spend your whole life not agreeing with things and end up agreeing with absolutely nothing. Eventually, you're going to be the only church that you can attend, the church of you. <laughs> That's going to be a fun time. <laughs> right? I always get concerned when church is not good enough and church is in the same. Oh, you know, if, you, if, if church is that bad, you know, well, we need another church. We need to, listen, if you're planning churches for the lost, I'm all over it. But if you're planning churches because you don't like what's going on, have a good time. But you know what, my friends? That's what happens when we start judging in that continuum. Now, we always want to come and say, what is biblical? Absolutely. And test, for sure. But don't get critical and get into these little gossip clutches about stuff. Blessed are the tongues that do not flap. (laughs) Jesus said in verse 33... A tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. We just moved in our new little house up here on the hill, and we got the ugliest looking apple tree you have ever seen in your life. (laughs) I'm serious. This apple tree is as ugly as you ever, I mean, it's got branches falling over here. It's got one shooting off toward the sky like he looks like John Travolta on the you know, disco floor. He's, you know, the whole thing, it's just insane. I've never seen a tree uglier than this tree. And it's never been pruned in his life. I don't know what is going on with that tree. But do you know, it is laden down with apples. And I thought, I, was, I, I, I need to prune this thing and shape it or do something. But I mean, I don't want to mess with what it's doing because it's doing good. And we're going to have more apple pies than I, I can even look at. You know, it's going to be an amazing fall of apple harvest. It's laden down. Um, I know it's a good tree because it's got great fruit. It's ugly, but it's fruitful. And maybe that's what our goal should be, you know. There's a place for you in God's kingdom. Oh, you're ugly, but you're fruitful. That's why I have such hope. I go, wow, you know, I'm fruitful, but man, I'm ugly. I got branches going over here and things not where they're supposed to be. Jesus said a good tree is identified by its fruit. I have another tree in our Canadian home. It's a pear tree. I told you about this before, but it produces a diseased pear. And the problem is it's got itself, it was planted in the wrong place. And it was planted to some trees that it's almost allergic to. I had our gardener talk to me about this. And he said, this tree is surrounded by bad company, is his quote. And he said, it's infected it, and its fruit, is, is, it dries up. It, you have these beautiful pears in the, in the beginning of summer, but by the time you get to harvest, they're all, the skin is all cracked, and they harden up. They're completely diseased. It's... A bad tree that's been corrupted by the company around it, and now its fruit is terrible. It can't be used. And when he said that to me, I thought, there's a lesson. You will be corrupted by what you surround yourself with. If you're surrounded by that bitterness, that, 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 that spiritual, yucky kind of criticism, you're going to become by what you take in. And that's why it's so important, the old saying, you know, Bad company corrupts good morals. Bad environment corrupts the spirit of God in your life. And you can become blasphemous in your attitudes and in your approaches by being around that which is negative and destructive. Be careful where you plant. Be careful what is around you. If you want good fruit, man, you've got to be in the right orchard. And you've got to be making sure that you're, that you're producing what God has for you to produce. And I love this about Jesus because it's just so straight up and so simple. He just says, a good tree, good fruit. That's how you identify it. And isn't that so simple and so true? When you come up to something fruitful and you see those beautiful, the beautiful fruit of it, 
It's like, man, this is good. There's a whole bank of blackberries by the church office. And I picked one off the other day and I put it in my mouth. And man, it was sweet. It like sweeter than normal. Uh, I think it's just that where that bank is and the sun just soaks into it, you know. And man, that fruit. And I, we went out there yesterday and picked a whole, I'm, I'm thinking blackberry jams on the way. You know what I'm saying? So we went out there and picked a whole bunch of blackberries. And, and I ate a few, of course. And uh, you could tell the blueberry stain on my fingers and around my mouth. You know, but one thing I noticed was that even though those things are thorny, the fruit is sweet. And, you know, blackberry bushes, we have a bit of it like, man, they're kind of nasty, but, man, they sure are good fruit. You can overlook the thorns when you see how good the fruit is. And why was that fruit so good? Because it had been soaked under the sun. Gang, when you bring your life under the power of the sun and you allow Jesus to just shine on you and permeate every part of your life, you know what happens to your life? You get sweet. You just, you're sweet to be around. And that's one of the things I love about this church, that you can see the, you can see the good fruit with the sweetness. It's like, oh, man, they're just sweet. A little thorny sometimes. <laughs> but, man, there's sweetness. You don't mind the thorns when it's sweet. But you pick the berry off and it's bitter and it's bleh, and it's still thorny, nasty. It's all about the fruit. It's all about the fruit. Verse 34, Jesus then looks to his audience and he says, You brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. Now, at that point, we would pull Jesus aside and say, Now, Jesus, um, the brood of snakes term... Not sure we should be using that kind of language. That's not politically correct. We're trying to win folks, trying to influence people. Um, you know, it's bad enough you call them sinners, but brood of snakes, it's just kind of, now you're being mean. That just sounds like a derogatory statement. That's Jesus. And we all love hippie Jesus, you know, walking around with the bread and the loaves and feeding people. We love hippie Jesus. Sandals and, you know, suffer the little children to come unto me. He blesses the children and heals the people. But when we get into teaching Jesus and, and the brood of snakes, Jesus, we're going, oh, that's a little offensive. It's funny how we, we kind of want Jesus, we kind of want a certain kind of Jesus. We want a Jesus that we can kind of mold into our image. How's that working for you? <laughs> right? We do. We want the Bible to say what we want it to say. So when it gets to something controversial in our life, we're going, well, that's Old Testament. <laughs> but that's in the book of John. Well, it's a quote from the Old Testament. But that's in the maps. Well, that's glued to the Old Testament. I don't know. I mean... You know, we, we want the Bible to say what we want it to say. People, and, and you know, one of the things I used to love about some of these old preachers, and I t t say it too a lot, but he, they, Billy was one of the biggest that did it. Billy Graham. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, because we actually believe what the Bible says. And here's our, here's our understanding of how it works. The Bible is true, and what God says in the Bible is the authority, and our life needs to conform to it. It is not a good book of nice things that we can cherry pick at the smorgasbord of our spiritual life, the food that we would like to partake of, because that's the stuff we like. No, we have to eat all of it. And in fact, I'm going to tell you honestly, I'm more happy when the Bible offends me than when it makes me feel good. Because I know that when the Bible speaks something into my life that's offensive to me, it's because God loves me. He sees something that needs to change. And if I try and build my faith around what I feel and what I want, I'm going to be, I'm going to be out there in a blasphemous wrong place. Fruitless. You know, the Bible says if you don't discipline your children, you hate them. It's strong, isn't it? But I see kids that have never been disciplined. There's such a disadvantage in life. 
They don't know how to take instruction. They don't know how to work hard. They don't know boundaries. They don't know what is up and what is down. They're, they're, these poor kids are just wandering around lost because they were never disciplined. You know? I was with my grandson the other day. <laughs> His name is Wynn. I call him Tank because he's built like one. He's just <laughs> always wants to fight. I love it. One day he'll beat me, but that's a long ways away. <laughs> yeah, not as long as I think. Yeah, because it's, it's, like, it's not like this. It's like this, isn't it? I'm going this way. He's coming this way. It's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a timetable of diminishing return. Anyway, he was in the truck the other day, and he was speaking to his sister, and what he was saying was not bad, but how he was saying it. Tank, don't talk like that. Why, Papa? I said, because your tone is wrong. He goes, what's the tone? I said, your attitude. It's wrong. You have to speak kindly and nicely. Sorry, Papa. You know, I want him to understand it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. And I want him disciplined well, and he is, his mom and dad do a great job, but when he's with me, he uses this little extra, you know, old school dose too, which is a whole new environment for him. Because you want your kids to grow up respectful and you want them to grow up well and you want to pour into them the things that they need because a good parent who loves their child will discipline their child. If you just let your kid be a free-range chicken, he's going to be a moron. <laughs> I'm just sorry. It's just true. You know that. You've seen those guys in the store, you know, four years old, you know, or 15, throwing a temper tantrum in the Walmart. It's like, you're 15. Grow up. I want it now. Stop it. That's insane. I remember James Dobson told a great story one time, and I've told it a lot of times since, but it's really good. Lady comes up to him at the end of a conference, and she says, I don't know what to do. You know, my son is 14 years old. He plays his music too loud. He never cleans his room. He never does the chores I ask him to do. She says, I just don't know what to do. And Dobson said to her, she says, ma'am, you need to move out of his house. <laughs> she said, no, no, it's my house. He says, well, act like it. <laughs> it's good. It's good. You brood of snakes. How could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth is simply the loudspeaker of the heart. Oh, I didn't mean that. Yes, you did. We say things and it's the abundance of our heart that speaks. And that's why we need to be taking inventory about what's going on in our heart. What is going on in our heart? What is happening? Are we mad? Are we angry? Are we bitter? Are we forgiving? Are we twisted? Are we controlling? Are we, what is going on in your heart today? In the heart toward your marriage, in the heart toward your work or your business. Are you glad to be able to do what you do? Are you happy about what God's given you? Are you blessed in the provision? Are you thankful? That's where we need to be. Because whatever is in our heart is going to come out. Are you living a life of regrets? Some people live just regret, regret, regret. Oh, I want to do this. I want to do better. I, but, but, I, but they never actually do what they need to do. Oh, as soon as I get over here, then I'm going to start tithing. And as soon as I make this, I'm going to start being obedient. And, and I, when I'm going to get involved over here as soon as I have a bit more time. And, and as soon as my wife becomes nice, then I'm going to love her a little bit better. And, and, and as soon as my husband stops being an idiot, then, then I'll, uh, it, 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 when, when is it ever going to end? What is in your heart determines what you say. In verse 35, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. Look at the word treasury. What is a treasury? A treasury is where you put the valuable. It's a place of storage that's protected. And we do this. 
Sometimes someone offends us and we go, oh man, that guy, Buzz, Buzz just totally offended me. I hate that guy. And we take that little seed of hatred and we take it over and we lock it inside the little treasury. Someone else will do something against us. I knew that's how people are. All, everyone's like this. Take that little root of bitterness and we take it over. We put it in the treasury. And what we do is we allow our treasury to be filled with certain things. We need to go into our heart. Sometimes we've been hurt by somebody. Maybe our father, maybe our mother, somebody in our family, a past relationship, a guy, a gal, a husband, a wife. We got wounded deeply. And so we took the wound and we didn't bring it to Jesus. We took that wound and we went over and we put it in the treasury of our heart. And then we begin to make decisions out of what's in the treasury. We started to to speak what was in the treasury. I remember one time, since we're just being honest here. First few years, man, when Dee and I were in the ministry, we were church planting and we were young and we had like very little money. Like it was tough. And I remember there were nights we would get to the, you know, the 13th of the month, two days before the mid-month paycheck and you know, sometimes the cupboards were like, ooh, okay, we got a box of craft dinner and some frozen peas. Okay. <laughs> you know, we'd phone our other friends who were church playing, hey, what do you guys got in the cupboard? Uh, we got a can of tuna and a loaf of bread. Great. We got craft dinner and peas. Let's put it together. We'll have tuna casserole dinner with peas and bread. And it was, I mean, and I laugh about it now, but it was like, oh, it was tough. And you wouldn't have, you know, and so years went by and after some blessing and faithfulness and working hard, there was some leftover provision. And I decided I wasn't going to be without cash ever again. I was done being without cash. So I had a, we had a walk-in closet in this house that we had redone and there was a drawer, a shallow drawer in the top about that thick. And there was some wood left over, some molding strips, and I cut them like a cash drawer. And I went out and I got $5,000 in cash. And I lined up my hundreds and my fifties and my twenties and my tens and I had them all in this little cash drawer, right in the secret treasury of my walk-in closet. Nobody knew about it except D, of course. And I would never, ever Never going to not have cash again. And I remember there were nights when she was out with the girls or whatever, doing stuff, and I was home by myself. I'd walk down to my walk-in closet, pull open the drawer, take out the hundreds. One, two, three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. The 50s. I just count it. I, for four years, I didn't spend a dime in it. I just would just go in and count it. <laughs> and, and one day, though, I'm in there doing this stupid thing, and the Lord goes, um, what, do you think I'm going to leave you abandoned? Like, God's not against you having a bit of cash on hand, but he's like, this is getting a little ridiculous. You're going down here counting your cash every five or six weeks. What are you doing? And uh, I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm just tired of was tired of not having enough. He says, well, did you ever go without a meal? No. Did I ever not pay a bill for it? No. Have I provided? Yeah. And are you being blessed today? Yeah. Well, then what are you worried about? But you have a treasury problem. I, we moved a couple of times after I got over that, and I forgot where the, it was. And later on, it was like, oh, yeah, that money's got to be around here somewhere. And Sure enough, it was in the bottom of a box, and I felt good that I hadn't lost it, but I felt really good that I hadn't worried about it. Yeah. Things had changed. The problem wasn't having the money. The problem was my heart issue with it. Yeah. Yeah. See? The treasury. What's going on in the treasury? What's going on in that place? Because Jesus says a good person produces good things out of the treasury. Why? Because they've been putting good things in the treasury. Junk in, junk out. 
Sin in, sin out. You build a relationship that's not based on God's word. You wonder why it's struggling and not fulfilling you. Why? Because it's upside down. It's not, the treasury is all, it's wrong stuff. And so the same is true in every part of our life, our attitudes, what we think, what we're working at. It's all about the heart. Load in biblical treasure and you will produce biblical fruit. Load in the treasure of the world and the ideas and the philosophies of the world. That's what's going to come back out. But it's going to come back out louder than what you put it in because that's how this works. Everything produces after its own kind. If you put evil in, more evil is going to come out because it germinates and grows. If you put good in, more good is going to come out because it germinates and grows. So lastly today, Jesus says this. I tell you the truth. You must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. That's one of those most convicting verses in the Bible for me. I love this verse because it helps me guard my mouth. Ever been in a situation where you say, hey, tell me about what happened over here, or hey, what's going on? Why is it that we love gossip so much as people? I mean, I know none of us ever read the National Enquirer. They only sell 15 billion of those things a week, but no one ever reads them. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> no one ever buys them, no one ever reads them, but they sell 15 billion of them. I don't know if it's that many, but... We love to hear the juice. Hey, what's going on over here? Hey, I heard about this. Did you hear about that? It's almost like a symphony of gossip. If you want to guard the treasury of your heart, folks, it's quite okay to say, hey, just stop a minute. I don't, I don't, is, this, is this going to edify? Is this going to build up a brother? I just want you to know here at the River of Life, if, if someone comes to you and says, hey, I want to talk to you about something. You have every right to go, hey, well, is it encouraging? Is it going to bless me? Is it going to edify someone in the church? Because if it's negative, I don't want to take it into my spirit. Thanks, but I just, no thanks. I just want to receive and hear a good report. Is it something fruitful? Did God do a miracle? Did someone get healed? Did you witness somebody that got saved? God bless someone's finances? Is it a good report? Great, I'm, I'm all in. If you just want to tell me about what's going on in someone else's deal, hey, thanks for sharing, but maybe share that to yourself. Because I don't want to be standing before the Lord one day and the Lord's going to say, now let's talk about this conversation and that conversation. Some of us have got a lot of stuff to deal with before the Lord on that day because we've been yappers. I have an Italian friend. I love him dearly. One of his favorite sayings is, those folks just need to shut their yaps. It's true. The words you say will either acquit, acquit you or condemn you. We will be either acquitted by the confession of our faith and the words that we spoke of life or we will be judged based upon the words that we said that either justified ourselves and our own sinful lives and the verbal destruction we did with, to other people. The mouth is like a sword. The words that we speak, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can what? Hurt me for my whole life. The words that people hear Man, they, they ring around your head forever. You know it, I know it. Let's face it, let's just be honest about this. I know I've gone a little bit later, but folks, please catch this. The words we speak either bring life and refreshing or they can bring condemnation and pain into people. And we need to guard our mouths and guard our hearts because the mouth isn't really the problem, is it? The mouth is just the delivery system of what's going on in the heart. And if the treasury is contaminated, then everything we say is going to be contaminated. So let's take the advice of Jesus here and let's do some inventory in the treasury. Let's go through there today and say, that's out, that's out, that's out. This is in, this is in, no more. It stops today. And you'll be surprised at what God will do in your life as the treasury is refurbished. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for the truth of your word, even when it's hard to hear. Lord, your word is so good. It's life. And Lord, thank you that it convicts us and it, 
it speaks into those places, Lord, that we often don't want to go. So often, Jesus, we've been building our life on things that are just wrong. Lord, relationships that have just been, they're not blessed of you. And Lord, just business situations and think philosophies and investments and money expenditures that we've done that haven't satisfied and worked out, Lord. There's all kinds of things, Lord, that we mess up because we forget, Lord, to come to you. And so, Lord, today I just pray that as we can just take a moment now, Lord, we want to look at our hearts. Because, Lord, I guess it all comes down to where the heart is. And so, Jesus, would you show us today what needs to be taken out of the treasury and thrown away? Lord, we invite you right now to come in and walk through the deepest place of our hearts. God, there's some stuff in our lives, Lord, because of real pain. And we've been doing sinful things because of pain. Lord, we've, some of us, Lord, have been thinking philosophies and thoughts that are just not of you. We've tried to form the Bible around our life and around what we want. We've tried to build Jesus in our own image. Lord, like I often think, Lord, you don't, you don't ride in our lives, Lord, you drive. And so, Lord, I just pray today that you would help us to see our heart the way you see our heart. And that you would show us right now, Jesus, what things need to be changed. Just as we're meditating for a moment and just thinking about this, I'd invite you to stand and I want our prayer team to come forward and take their positions at the sides and One thing we've always said here at the river since I've been here is that we believe in the proclamation of God's word. We believe in the application of God's word. But we also believe in the activation. We want to activate now what we've heard today in your life through prayer, through ministry. And if if the Lord's poking something in your heart today, don't, don't run away from that. And we've often said, and we want to keep saying, that here at the river, coming forward for prayer is not because there's something wrong or something bad. Coming forward for prayer at the river is just how we move forward with God. We celebrate people that are honest. We love honesty here. And we just want to be honest with Jesus and with you. Just like me, you know, who I was down in my basement with my drawer open, counting my treasury. That needed to change for me so I could be free. And some of you have got some stuff maybe going on in your treasury today. And we just want to pray for it. So as Nick leads us in some song and some worship, if you need to go, you can go. Next week we're going to have a great time as we look at signs and wonders. But right now we just want to spend some moments and give you opportunity to just make some changes in the treasury of your heart. Make some adjustments today. So if you're here this morning and you go, you know, Dave, that's me. Just slip up your hand. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. You say, yeah, I need to make some changes in the treasury of my heart. Yes, God bless you. Yes, yes, yes. Anyone else today? Thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Yeah. 
So Jesus, Lord, for my friends today, I just want to ask you by your spirit to now just open up those specific things. Help them to see clearly, Lord, what it is. We bring those things to you. Lord, as we come and just get some specific prayer on the specifics of those things, Lord, just do a good work in Jesus' name. I invite you just to come for prayer. Those of you that need it, those of you that are saying, yeah, that's me today. I need some prayer in those areas. Come on down. Our team will love on you and pray for you. sense today that there may be some more that just need some prayer. Just, we don't want to rush away. We just want to love on you today. If you want to talk, pray, or got a question, don't be afraid today to just step into the moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You are good. So good. So very, very good. So good, so very, very, very good. God bless you, folks. Have a great day. See you next week at the river. Invite somebody, invite a friend. Let them know that Jesus loves them.